Good afternoon. My name is Timothy Hampton. I'm the director of the Doreen B. Townsend Center for the Humanities at the University of California at Berkeley. I'm happy to welcome you to today's edition of the Berkeley Book Chats. Berkeley Book Chats feature a member of the Berkeley faculty in conversation about a recently published book. Before we turn to the main event today, let me say a word or two about next semester's activities at the Townsend Center. We will continue on with a full slate of book chats. We'll also be continuing with our series called Remaking Sense, the Humanities and Pandemic Culture. And we'll be welcoming in February, the Poet Laureate of the United States, the poet Joy Harjo for a set of activities uh, discussing her work and Native American writing in general. So please keep an eye out for those activities. Uh, check the Townsend Center website and uh, you can find out all the details there. Today's activity, which is our last book chat of the semester, is particularly, it's a particular pleasure to welcome our guests today. Um, my guests are Mario Tello, who is professor of comparative literature and classics at the University of California, Berkeley, in conversation with Damon Young, who is uh, in the Department of French and Film Studies. And they'll be talking about Mario's recently published book, Archive Feelings, A Theory of, Friend of, Theory of Greek Tragedy. So I'm happy to turn it over to um, Mario and Damon. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Tim. What a pleasure, Mario, to have a chance to discuss this book with you. Um, I do feel like I'm in a TV studio, um, which uh, it's exciting to do it in this format and to see you and to, to talk uh, live, as it were, instead of by email. Um, so, so archive feelings, um, a theory of Greek tragedy. I'm going to say just a few things about the book and um, some of the things that I noticed while I was reading it, and then I'll invite you to um, elaborate on my account. I have some questions for you, and we'll also um, leave time for questions from the audience um, in the second half of the of the hour. So this this is a a fascinating, a fun read, an exhilarating read, a dizzying um, uh, and dizzyingly erudite um, survey of the corpus of, of, of Greek uh, tragedy. And on the one hand, the aim is to formulate what you call an anti-cathartic aesthetics of Greek tragedy. Of course, catharsis being the normal way that tragedy is understood following Aristotle, in other words, the, the purpose of tragedy would be to arouse fear and pity as the, as the dominant emotions in order to kind of expurge them and restore equilibrium through catharsis. So that's the, you're, you're rejecting that reading of tragedy. And in your, in your account, tragedy is inherently anti-cathartic. It's always undermining the cathartic impetus that we might also find there. Um, so that, that, that's what tragedy does. It's also what your, your theory of tragedy produces from tragedy. And you do this through a series of exquisite and I think ultra formalistic um, in a good way, close readings of texts from across the corpus of Greek tragedy, plays by Sophocles, Euripides, Aeschylus. Um, and that anti-cathartic aesthetics is related to what you call borrowing Derrida's phrase, archive fever. So there's some constitutive relationship between anti-catharsis and archive fever or the impossible search for lost origins. So I wanna ask you about that. Okay, but secondly, there's a, there's a methodological aim or desire here, which is to bring to bear the resources of critical theory, um, French theory or deconstruction, Derrida being kind of central reference um, throughout the book, but also Deleuze, Ranciere, John and L.C., and other and other kind of French philosophers, and psychoanalysis. There's an extended um, engagement with Freud and Lacan, Lacan um, as well as other critical theorists from Adorno to Stephen Best, Judith Butler, and many, many um, other references. So you bring to bear that other corpus or cor corpuses to, to bear on your reading of text from antiquity. Um, and so what emerges is an unexpected assemblage, um, well, maybe expected by me, but maybe not by every reader, in which the classical references and resonances of psychoanalytic theory, with its, you know, drawing on Oedipus myth, et cetera, and the references to antiquity and critical theory, for example, in dialectic of enlightenment through archive fever and, and Butler's Antigone's claim, those references become more than just 
resonances or, or references, they're fully fleshed out explorations. And on the other hand, the classical corpus is subjected to the indeterminations of the most fine-grained deconstructive reading. So the critical theory and uh, Greek tragedy um, complicate, um, destabilize, um, uh, transfigure each other um, in producing this new assemblage, which to me was extremely exciting. Um, as more of a reader of critical theory than of Greek tragedy, but, um, but you brought, uh, as I said, the classical references to life. Okay, so which is to say that against the contextualists, as you um, characterize some other, you know, another method of kind of historicist method of reading, you read the texts um, uh, like very explicitly, deliberately, programmatically as texts, as literary texts um, for their formal tropes. And, and in your readings, they formally, these texts as literature formally embed a tragic aesthetics for which you offer other um, analogs throughout the book. And my favorite uh, moment, unsurprisingly, is your brilliant uh, short reading of Psycho um, in the amazing chapter of Crypts. Um, in your view, it's a highly archival film. Of course, the crypt, basement crypt in which Norman Bates keeps his, his mother. And you, in a very brief reading, you show how the circular figure in the shower scene is a loop which subverts the what you call the um the catharsis of marion crane's shower so the shower is a cathartic moment of purification but also of release at the end of a day or maybe as a neurotic um, resonance that teleological movement of catharsis is undermined by the repetition of the loop which we see in the drain and in the, the repetition of the, the formal motif of the circle that, that's just one example of how formal reading is um, producing this um, uh, argument in which catharsis only appears to be the structure of the text and it, it's ultimately being undermined. We also have Thelma and Louise's suicidal suspension over the, over the uh, ravine, um, Daniel Liebeskin's Jewish Museum, Berlin poems by Wilfred Owens and you end with a novel by Toni Morrison. So tragic aesthetics extend beyond the, the classical period into to inform a wide range of um, text in different mediums. Okay, now I mentioned your use of psychoanalysis and of course in particular the death drive which is really kind of the central thread throughout the book which you read through its kind of um, taking up in queer theory um, specifically in the work of Lee Edelman as well as um, Zizek and Joan Kopchak and others who are committed to a deeply non-reparative uh, psychoanalysis, which is say non-therapeutic uh, analysis for which the death drive is the er figure of, of negativity. And in Edelman, the death drive, um, he connects um, uh, the negativity of the drive in psychoanalysis to the kind of um, the, to the, the, the differential process of, of, of textuality, the, the deconstruction and psychoanalysis are conjoined there in his use of the death drive and, and similarly for you. And the death drive you suggest is archival in its, in its own way. Um, and then schematically you, you align catharsis, the normal way in which tragedy is read with the pleasure principle aiming at the kind of resolution um, the release of tension, the repair of crisis, the reconsolidation of the ego, I suppose, after a momentary disturbance. So catharsis is aligned with the pleasure principle and tragic aesthetics, which is anti-cathartic in your reading, is aligned with the death drive, which is not an end precisely. The death drive doesn't arrive at its at any destination. Um, and even in the in the great last chapter about um, figures of orgasm, these kind of refracted figurations of orgasm in your reading um, is not a release. Uh, it's something that exists in anticipation or in retrospection, slipping immediately into a kind of postcoital tristesse. So even orgasm isn't a figure for cathartic release um, in the way that you read it. And so what replaces catharsis in your reading of tragedy in the death drive is, I think, jouissance, um, not as kind of the release of orgasm, but as the proximity and postponement of death. 
Um, okay, I'm almost done uh, with my with my accounts. So in place of resolution, your 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 readings turn around repetitions, loops, uh, convulsions, futility, um, ambiguities, indeterminacies, multiplicities of reference, not just of characters but of plots and formal devices um, in an almost fine-grained philological way. And you have a, um, a fabulous description of your own method at, on page 280 as at once hermeneutic and anti-hermeneutic, performing, this is a quote, performing in the approach to the, to the texts, the very tragic aesthetics it seeks to recover. So I think that's true in the way that you read the books. You're also evoking, producing in the read of these tragic emotions, these kind of anti-cathartic, tragic feelings. Um, your, your text is performing it and soliciting that response or eliciting it. Um, and you also position your, your formalism as at once critical and post-critical, a surface reading and a non-surface reading. Um, and so in your engagement with these critical positions, you prefer the suspension of the oppositions or their, or their kind of collapse into in distinction to any kind of polemical side taking. Though I do have um, some questions about that. Okay, is there anything you want to add to my account and before I ask you? Well, some you did such a wonderful job. I mean, I don't think I even ever written the book because you know you have done. You are describing. You are describing something that uh, I entirely identify with, of course. But you have done it so beautifully, and I could not have hoped for a better reader. Thank you so much, Damon. No, the pleasure is mine. This is a very, yeah. this is a very good read. A very exciting book to read. Um, okay, well, let me let me prompt you into some some specific directions with some questions. So let's start with feelings. The feelings of the title. It's called Archive Feelings. I explained the theory of tragedy part, which is the kind of argument, the strong argument that you make in the book. But feelings, it seems like affect theory flickers in and out of view and feelings are present in every chapter. But I was wondering why, why feelings um, uh, in relationship to the archive in your conception? Well, because this is an attempt, I would say, to uh, connect affect theory with psychoanalysis also. You know, to an extent, affect theory came about as a response to or even a polemic against psychoanalysis and the kind of perverse dynamics that psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis seeks to uncover. So I, on the other hand, want to show that uh, the affective turn can be placed into dialogue with psychoanalysis. Uh, and that can happen at the level of form. So, um, so that would be the answer that uh, I, I want to give now on the spot on why, you know, I emphasize feelings. You know, I was very interested, you know, in the affective turn and even in new materialism uh, for a while. And then I sort of went back, you know, to uh, the psychoanalytic foundations of certain trends, you know, of the affective turn and see whether it was possible to find uh, a form of uh, reconciliation of the two and uh, uh, trying to deal with the problem of the aesthetic experience of tragedy was my way, you know, of creating this dialogue. I see. It's true that in the book you also engage with new materialism and object-oriented approaches where, and post-human approaches where um, characters are always turning into immaterial or material. Even if I, I, at a certain point, I also psychoanalyze them. For example, exactly. you know, in the chapter on Philoctetes and Ecuba, when I talk about... Uh, you know, uh, these movement towards, uh, you know, the sea, towards uh, the generative flow of elemental life, I want to, which of course is a Deleuzian uh, move uh, becoming water and intensity and the body without organs, but I also focus on water, the medium of catharsis, as a kind of undulating motion, which uh, sort of keeps 
the fourth and the fourth and that going. So I see also this Deleuzean scenario as haunted by a sort of psychoanal psychoanalytic dev driven movement. Yes, you're a very generous reader in wanting to bring together antag theoretical antagonists. That's right. That's kind of one of the signature moves, as you said, affect theory, which is quite often quite polemically opposed to yeah. psychoanalysis um, with psychoanalysis and Deleuze and Freud um, reading his reading Deleuze and kind of um, animus against psychoanalysis as itself psychoanalytic, for example. Um, in very convincing ways, I would say, it's not just kind of for the sake of it, but you're showing these shared movements of thought that kind of exceed each paradigm, but that are, that, that connect them. Yeah, I think that tragedy really becomes an opportunity for seeing how these trends that seem so different from each other can actually be brought together also because these uh, uh, theorists that I'm dealing with were voracious readers of tragedy. Exactly. Uh, not just Freud, but also Derrida, of course, uh, and Deleuze, all of them. So uh, my argument is, of course, not whether, you know, they, whether tragedy plays a role in their theorization, but uh, I think that I'm trying to use the specific problem of uh, uh, the aesthetic experience of tragedy to show the possibility of a dialogue between this material and uh, different strands of postmodernism. Post yeah. Absolutely. Um, I, when I was reading the Hecuba chapter, Hecuba is becoming water, as you said, it was the figure of catharsis, but also the suspension of catharsis. I thought of, um, I don't know if you have read this, Leo Bassani and Ulysse Dutois do a reading of the ending of Le Mépris, Contempt Godard's um, film, which is oh, a, film about the, about the, it's a film about the a film version of the Odyssey, right? So sure. And, and in the ending of that film, the camera kind of pans away from these actors incarnating the mythical characters to slow pan to the ocean, which dissolves into the horizon and I, beside, oh, beautiful. it's beautiful exactly there's a kind of there's a dissolution of the human and mythical frames of reference into this kind of elemental indistinction um that that uh, that i thought of as I, I, as i was reading that chapter um there's a, an interesting question came up in the chat from richard armstrong which might be helpful to, uh, to why do you think catharsis has been so obsessively mapped onto tragedy to begin with I guess it's the Aristotelian... Uh... Well, it's the Aristotelian uh, legacy, of course, and uh, uh, Aristotle was seen, you know, in modern criticism as the savior of tragedy because he saved tragedy from the Platonic condemnation. Plato says, oh, tragedy is bad. So what uh, uh, Aristotle does is basically to uh, emphasize my Mises as a filter that protects the subject from the harming effects of tragedy, okay? But protecting the subject means to calcify the subject. It means to contain the subject. It means to restrict its, uh, basically, its subjectivity. So uh, even the most progressive interpretation of catharsis, I'm referring, for example, to Jacob Bernays' reading of catharsis, which is programmatically anti-moralistic. And he sees a kind of ecstatic moment, a kind of expansion of sensory capabilities that happens before the moment of restoration. Even Bernays then talks about the restoration of an equilibrium. And that's the problem that I have with, uh, uh, with this reading. Uh, also because the very idea of restoration, and that's the, the constructive move that led me to archive fever, the very idea of restoration that is all recapturing a form of imagine before precisely triggers archive fever, precisely triggers that movement towards 
recapturing something that cannot be recaptured. So I would say that my model is anti-cathartic, but it's also a way to show the kind of that driven dynamic that catharsis can produce precisely because it's predicated on a form of restoration. There is the problem of that RE that, uh, that creates the loop. Right. So, and another thing that maybe I, I want to add is that Freud and Lacan bought entirely into the Aristotelian model. Mm. So the two theorists, you know, of the dev drive, when they talked about tragedy, uh, Freud in those famous pages of Beyond the Pleasure Principle, where he discusses, you know, the, um, the fourth and da, he seems to, he mentions tragedy and he seems to place it under the rubric of mastery, even if those pages of Beyond the Pleasure Principle are extremely complicated. And uh, as Judy Butler pointed out in a very important 1991 article, even there, even in the moment in which he says that, you know, the fourth and da is about mastery, actually that idea of mastery is immediately, you know, uh, compromised, complicated by the idea of non-mastery. And then Lacan, when he talks about uh, tragedy in the splendor of Antigone, that is to say in his theorization of Antigone as a figure of the dev drive, he says that the viewer, the reader, is protected <laughs> from the dev drive, from the dev driven force of Antigone by her splendor. So both of them, probably as readers of both Aristotle and especially of Aristotle's, of how Aristotle was read by Bernays, you know, cannot uh, basically get rid of catharsis. They are still attached to it. I see. Yeah, even, even Freud. I mean, it's quite extraordinary that these two people, you know, I would say it's more extraordinary for Lacan, I would say. In the case of Freud, actually I see Freud as more forward thinking than Lacan in this respect, because in those pages of Beyond the Pleasure Principle, precisely because the texture of those pages is so fraught, is so thickened, even if he places tragedy under the rubric of the Pleasure Principle, you know, his discussion is so complicated that I don't think it would be, I don't think it would be inconceivable to do a reading against the grain that uh, shows Freud's own discomfort with this reading. But in Lacan, on the other end, Lacan was so polemical, you know, with Freud's interpretation of the fourth and da, in Lacan, it's pretty clear. He says the reader, the viewer is protected from you know, he is screened off from the death-driven negativity of Antigone by the beauty of the poetry, the splendor that he talks about. Right, and you, I see, and your reading of the poetry is producing something um, different to that. Well, I don't think that that, I think that the splendor is precisely the death-driven intensity. Exactly. Exactly. The fort and the da returns throughout every chapter of your book, um, with the da naming the attempt to to consolidate, um, right, or to or to restore order where where it's been disrupted. To create a reparative moment, yeah. Right. And I I very much enjoyed the refusal of the reparative throughout um, your readings. Uh, as you know, reparative reading, a term from Eve Cedric, has been taken widely taken up and kind of celebrated it's very easy to kind of sign up for reparative reading it makes it really feel good um yes i totally <laughs> agree with you and for me um so i very much sympathize with both berlin and and edelman's attempt to resist you know the uh, identification of the legacy of sedwick with reparative reading and also i am resisting the tendency to dichotomize reparative and uh, um, paranoid, 
And also I'm resisting this uh, caricature of deconstruction as, uh, you know, aseptic and ascetic and scientific or scientist, you know, I don't think that in the construction there has ever been, or at least in my reading of it, an attempt to exclude, you know, the mood or the disposition of the interpreter from the interpretive act. Uh, so that's why I'm more sympathetic with uh, another concept of Sedwick, that is uh, what she calls ardent reading in, uh, in tendencies, uh, which she characterizes as a form of uh, perverse reading, vis visceral reading. And so the ardent reading for me is a kind of burning reading, which I cannot connect, of course, with archive fever. And it's an attempt never to take form for granted, you know, sort of refusing the idea that form can be discovered, but actually embracing the idea that form needs to be brought into being constantly, mm -hmm. you know, um, through this process of relentless spinning, in a sense. Right. The, the spinning being the reading. I mean, because yeah. so your 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 work, your your readings, which are consummately deconstructive resist the easy consolations of the reparative nothing is repaired even in these even when the tragic the movement of the tragic narrative tries to implement repair it's, it undermines itself that's what you kind of show on each occasion and the anti-reparative is not just negative it's not just nihilistic but it's actually emancipatory right so that, for example, emerges, you know, in my reading of Medea and in my reading of Heracles, like in the finale of uh, Medea, right? We all are familiar with the image of Medea suspended in the air, right? So for me, that is a moment of delayed vision or what Lessing calls a pregnant moment. That is to say, you know, of course, she's suspended and she doesn't move, but the possibility that she may crash does not, cannot be entirely removed from our eyes or the eyes of our mind. So that's a moment in which representation is not sufficient. There is another level, you know, that's why I said delayed vision. There is another level that complicates representation that creates another scenario. And in this case, it's a scenario that problematizes the future of Medea, that she might go to Athens and so forth. And so these two scenarios, we can say using Deleuze, the virtual image and the actual image, create a moment of disidentification, create a, a gap. You know, we can say in Rancierian term that the mythos, the plot, wants us to see something, but there is something else. There is this recalcitrant, there is this stubborn effect of reading that complicates this level, creating this gap, and that's the possibility of an other scenario. That's a possibility of something that does not turn into a calcifying actuality, but into a potentially, you know, emancipatory future that is never present, a kind of avenir which opens up a gap into the smooth surface of what, you know, the mythos, the plot wants us to see. Right. It's not an emancipation that we can easily translate into existing terms, um, narrative terms or political terms. Um, it, it is about the suspension of, of resolution um, and the holding together, as you say, of, of two or more possibilities, an, an actual and a virtual, every actual being kind of like um, suffused with a virtuality that is um, threatens to negate it, but also expands it in unexpected directions. Exactly. So there are this moment of oscillation, 
you know, between the virtual and the actual is actually kind of anarchy in the sense that it disrupts the homogenizing impetus of the archive and its uh, aspiration towards sameness, but it's also anarchy in the political sense, in the sense that it becomes a sort of anarchic moment, a kind of disruption, you know, of the, of the political status quo, which, uh, you know, representation in a sense endorses, especially if we think of the Aristotelian model where the plot is structured, you know, according to the laws of necessity and probability as Aristotle thinks. And Aristotle th says that any disruption, if you move things around, if you take one thing out and you replace it with something else, everything falls apart and it should not be done. <laughs> Um, just to come back to the opposition between reparative and paranoid that you mentioned earlier, it's your your approach is also um, not um, that kind of. Uh, I think that what's what I, the quote I mentioned earlier, where you say it's it's hermeneutic and anti-hermeneutic, or it's, it's you're not kind of mining the text for the deep truth that it. Um, its surface conceals. This is what surface reading criticized the idea that there's something underlying that the, 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 the paranoid reader can find by decoding, you know, the, the, the text's displacements. You don't really, you, there's nothing hidden in the text in your readings. What your readings do is they kind of multiply possibilities and through um, focusing on focusing our attention on semantic instabilities often it's pre prefixes and suffixes and, and formal devices um and the, the create kind of rhizomatic connections across unexpected narrative strands also across texts unexpectedly um so there's not a paranoid operation um although i think there's always a mischaracterization of what critical i think it is yeah i mean i when i talk, think about the construction and the deconstruction that sedwick taught us yeah. practice, I really don't see uh, this desire to discover the hidden truth. I yeah. mean, that for me seems a form of uh, uh, philological positivism, <laughs> you know? That, that is, yeah. It's the description of positivism. There is, you know, interpretation is a kind of thing that does not appear on the surface, but needs to be brought out. The deconstruction is, of course, against that. Absolutely. So, um, so that's why, you know, I strongly problematize. And of course, I'm not against uh, uh, repara certain expression of reparative reading and surface reading. I'm just talking about certain versions of it, which seem to get to the very dangerous uh, a position of thinking that interpretation is just reading, that is to say, excludes a kind of involvement of the interpreting subject. And so there is a kind of contradiction. On the one hand, there is an evaluation of mood and disposition and the affect. On the other hand, there is this fantasy through the concept of just reading of excluding, you know, the interpreter from the act. So it can become a form of presentism mm -hmm. as though the text, you know, spoke by itself, mm -hmm. you know, and did not, need, did not need, you know, anybody in order to speak. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I mean, in a way, what you're doing is a kind of service reading, and it resonated for me with Stephen Best's book, None Like Us, which is another kind of... Oh, that's a wonderful book for me, and very influential. In fact, I open my... So, in fact, his version of surface reading is super interesting. Uh, I'm it's talking... shot through with negativity. It's shot through with impossibility and absence. Exactly, and this possession and this identification and what, she, what he brilliantly calls disappearance, appearance in disappearance, which is right. a concept I use a lot in right. my readings. Right, you're both interested in the, in the, the, the status of the archive as, a, as an, an archive. Exactly, as anarchivic by definition, yes. So I do want to ask you about this term archive 
which we've already talked about a little bit, but why, why did you make that the central one for your analysis? Um, in your readings, it means many different things. Um, obviously, it's a repository. It's an attempt to consolidate a past and therefore to fix it. It's, it's death-driven in that way. Um, the death drive is also, in a way, an archival desire to return to a former state. But the body is an archive in your reading. It, 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 it retains traces of its past experiences. And characters such as Medea and Heracles are what you call an archival assemblage. Um, why is this the container term for your reading of tragedy? Yeah, I thought that this could be, as, as you just beautifully said, a very capacious uh, hermeneutic uh, model, basically to try to make concrete you know, the kind of uh, uh, aesthetic experience that I'm trying to reconstruct. Because when people think about the archive, they think about preservation. Right about saving things, about, but of course, even in English, storing up and storing away. So archiving can mean saving, but it can also mean putting it somewhere so that you don't think about it. So it's a form of uh, forgetting. It's mm -hmm. a form of erasure. So if catharsis, you know, can be seen as a form of preservation, right, of the subject after a moment of disruption. So if we think about the complexities of the archive and map those complexities onto the idea of closure and preservation that has been associated with catharsis, maybe we can find ways to start problematizing this concept. So I think that that gave me, as I said, the opportunity to show the instability of these uh, reparation, restoration that we are so attached mm -hmm. to seeing when we think of tragedy. Uh, there is really a fear in interpreters in thinking that that restoration does not happen. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. But that's why I think that a lot of people are gonna be uncomfortable with my reading. Because you know, reparation is seen as the most indispensable for for tragedy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, that discomfort is one of the aspects that uh, it's a tragic affect, and it's the affect that your book produces as well. Yeah, I want to read a little quote about um, the archive that kind of captures some of the meanings that you give it. So this is. On page 34, you wrote, whether conceptualized as circling around the lost past or the Lacanian real, the immaterial thing beyond the symbolic or the recalcitrant and aloof object, the inaccessible bodily inside, the finality of sexual pleasure or the materiality of death itself, the archive fever that permeates tragedy, chills as it burns, freezes as it shakes, binds as it shatters all at once and endlessly. So there we see how this arc, so tragedy is permeated by archive fever in, in, in these many senses, which might be circling around the lost past and with the, with the futile aim of restoration, or in your Lacanian terms, the, the desire for the real, for what escapes symbolization, or the inaccessible and aloof object. The body or, even, or even I would say the very idea of intense feeling. Uh -huh. you know, because, you know, we uh, approach tragedy with the desire, you know, to get a very intense experience, but that can turn into its own objet petit in a sense, and uh, uh, sort of create this extra loop. So, for example, that is something that I, I see as shaping the Phenicae, a mm -hmm. play in which, as I suggest, the archive feeling is boredom. Right. right. Is that the word archive of, fatigue? Is that the chapter about archive? Yeah, it's about archive fatigue. And that's basically the pleasure of boredom as really an attempt to look for an intense feeling and uh, this desire for plenitude mm -hmm. is actually a sort of aestheticized experience of the lack. Mm -hmm. It's uh, a bit like in the in the final chapter on tragic endings, you refuse 
the idea of orgasm as an intense feeling. Exactly. Of and even in that case, it has an emancipatory force, I would say, because if we think of what happens in the finale of Antigone, mm -hmm. that, and of course, you know, I want to say that the, um, the sexualized overtones that I see in this chapter is not something that I'm the first one no. to point out. So I'm, I'm crazy enough in this book, but you know, here, you know, my craziness uh, is not as uh, pronounced as one may think. What I'm trying to do is to see whether we can use those uh, sexualized moments to think about uh, aesthetic pleasure and sexual pleasure especially because uh, in his biological works, Aristotle does use the word catharsis to indicate both menstruation and ejaculation. So there is a kind of sexual release expressed by Aristotle. And in these three finale, it's quite astonishing that in these three finales of three very famous plays, Agamemnon, uh, Antigone, and Oedipus the king, there is this imagery of spurting blood in a very sexualized context. And in the case of Antigone, this is Emon, you know, uh, basically trying to uh, establish kind of necrophilic contact with Antigone after she has committed suicide. And uh, at the level of form, the release is problematized by chiasmus and enjambments that sort of dilute the event of the sexual climax, introducing a kind of uh, uh, dimension of duration. And that sort of makes us see Antigone as recoiling from this sexual contact. Uh, so that her name, Antigone Against Generation, you know, continues even after her death when, you know, Emon tries, you know, to, uh, to create this kind of sexual connection post-mortem. Mm -hmm. it's, it's wonderfully queer. I, which I, wanted, I wanted to ask you about this, um, about in which ways you, you see this as a queer project. So what you're not doing is reading the kind of homoerotics of Greek tragedy, the kind of masculine homo. I mean, you are. That's not. It's not absent, but that's one way in which you know you could a queer approach to antiquity has 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 pursued is to is to kind of make those homoerotics uh, draw them out. Queerness is much more queer, much more destabilizing in in your. Um, in your readings and in the in the, the the book's final footnote which i'll just give you maybe you can riff on it you write rather than seeing queer archives i suppose specifically like queer archives of queer experience as privileged instantiations of the contradictions of the archive as some queer theorists have done i propose that we view the archival object as a model for queerness in itself what yeah that? because uh, um I mean, the mutilated object, the archival object, can be seen as a kind of refusal of completion, can be seen as a kind of refusal of the objecthood of the object, right? And so it's a kind of refusal of the production of the object that wants it complete. And so... I see these as a, I see the archive as queer precisely because it rejects the prospect of any form of actualization, any form of calcification and any expression of the normative. So I'm very much, you know, um, I'm, I'm very um, sympathetic with uh, the theorization of queerness that you find in Berlin and Michael Warner, or also with Judy Butler's famous article on queerness as critique, mm -hmm. and her other article on, which she published after the election of Obama, where she warned against, you know, what she called the um, exuberant complacency that 
you know, could have uh, emerged after the election of Obama. So uh, uh, in, my, in my readings, I, I, I try to see how even literal queerness, that is the twistedness, the torsion of forms points to this anarchy, that is to this rejection of actualization. Mm -hmm. I, I enjoyed the, your rereading of Oedipus the King, which of course is so, so such a saturated <laughs> legacy yeah. and in which, you know, the queerness might be in the kind of incestuous dynamics of in, in some of the homoerotic resonances between Laius and, and Oedipus. But you, you, in your reading, it's more than that. It's, this, it's the kind of semantic instability um, of formal processes that are proliferating meanings and, 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 and possibilities um, in excess, not only of the heteronormative frame, which the play is already blowing up in many ways, but, but of like the state of, of, a human, of a human frame, of the framework of representation or referentiality. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's a basically a, a, a way of characterizing my reading of Oedipus that I didn't think of, but that's, that's beautiful, uh, what you just said. And uh, I think that that is also very queer as a reading, also because I start from, you know, a recent uh, intervention of Agamben on, uh, you know, the uncanny meaning of Arcos, you right. know which is origin, but it's also uh, anus, something right, that right, I, never, right. I never thought of. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, um, so I, I do some um, things with that. Also sort of involving liars in these loop of erotic attachments, yeah. not just your caster. I've um sorry I've taken you to the the book's most sexual moments, which is not yeah, it's, fine. It's, it's not the dominant note in the book actually. Um, uh, just on the Arcos, I was also thinking of Jack Halberstam's Wild Things as I was reading. This. Oh, I love that book. It resonates so much. with this book in Jack's play on an anarchy. Um, exactly. Um, and there is a sense of the wild that you that is part of your tragic. Um, your well, I've just asked Jack Alberstam to write something on the Bacchae and the wild. That would be that, that would be an interesting encounter. That's great. Um, I want to invite people who are viewing to um, type your questions in the chat, and I will bring them to Mario's attention. There was an earlier question about um, negativity when we were talking about negativity and the death drive, um, whether you're um, conceiving of it in a kind of dialectical way or Hegelian way. Um, and Alan Miller suggested if there's a Hegelian impetus behind the um, dialect, you know, the, what you're doing with affect theory and psychoanalysis. But I guess the question is really, is, is a method question about w whether dialectics is, is um, informing your reading of your use of, of the negative or if in a more Deleuzean way, you're actually not interested in in dialectics again to me it seems like it's both and there's a door yes. uh, i mean this is something that uh, um my readers you know the readers you know for the press really uh, asked me to do they thought that sometimes i just um did not want to align myself with uh, you know a certain what just one theoretical point of view and uh, they thought that sometimes that could produce some dissonance. Mm -hmm. So I tried to um, make explicit my programmatic attempt to create a sort of theoretical eclecticism. Um, and uh, so, for example, in the chapter on uh, um, Philoctetes and uh, Ecuba, you know, there is an attempt to reconcile the Rida and the Leus. Um, so, and to, let's say, problematizing the Leusian vitalism mm -hmm. through, you know, the Ridian ethics. So, and I think that that's something that uh, I also encourage my, my students to do, um, to try to, to see whether, you know, apparent oppositions, you know, between theoretical schools can be, you know, overcome. Precisely because, you know, uh, we have to, push against the binary, even when we talk about uh, theoretical schools. Um, right. I want to ask you about your use of theory in relationship to 
one of the fields you're addressing, which is classics. Um, um, and I guess the, the obvious charge of anachronism when you're, when you're applying 20th century um, and 19th century critical categories to uh, um, an earlier corpus. And also, it also relates to your use of psychoanalysis. Obviously, there's no, there's no psychoanalytic subjects in the modern sense in um, Greek tragedy. So does it, what justifies using Freudian uh, concepts I mean, not that you're psychoanalyzing the characters, obviously. I, I already kind of know in advance the answer, but I'd love to hear you say it. What justifies using, uh, what, 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 for, what, what was your response to the charge of anachronism? Well, anachronism, you know, is another queer move, which I would endorse without any problem, precisely because I do see the text not as... Uh, um, establishing a connection with its original context, but as a kind of archive of multiple effects of reading that are brought out diachronically. So I really see the text as these possibilities of reading shading into each other and partially actualized diachronically. And uh, um, in a sense, certain forms of historicism, of reconstructivism, uh, produce the same kind of reductionism of catharsis. They try to, con precisely, if you want to limit meaning to you know, the effect produced in a context that you posit as original, you are containing the text you're containing its possibilities in, in the same way in which catharsis contains, you know, or tries to contain, you know, the aesthetic potential of that text. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my movie is Adornian, I would say, you know, in a sense, the, uh, this text is political precisely because it does not connect with the context, because it's in a kind of dissonant or dissensual, you know, relation with, uh, you know, what we posit as its original context. Right. It's, its textuality is what separates it from its context. There's a, there's a, exactly, there's a, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, in some sense, an autonomous thing that, ha that um, that's what makes it what it is. Exactly. And of course, my reading, I would say, is not anti-historicist, but it's an historicist. So I'm not, which I think is kind of an important difference. It's not, I'm not against, you know, history, but I certainly don't rely, you know, on, on historicist and on an historicist approach. I'm programmatically, you know, uh, challenging that. Right. You're not interested in what the text can tell us about the context that produced them or what they reveal about ancient Greek uh, beliefs or practices. Um, um, you're, yes, so it's, it is kind of anti-contextualist, I think. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> you don't want to be anti Anti-contextualist, anti maybe not anti-historicist. Uh -huh. um, maybe there is a sort of a little difference. In any case, I mean, even in more simple, in simpler terms is, why should we privilege just the ancient readers? Why should we just privilege, you know, the spectators of that show? How about us? How about the readers who were interested in tragedy, you know, in that huge lapse of time between antiquity and us? Why don't they care? Why should we just care about that moment in time? Right. So in your approach, the text becomes a living, it's a call. It's a call to a practice of, of reading that is that is undoing the reader. Yeah, in a sense, reconstructivism, you know, does not allow us to make sense and appreciate the aesthetic stubbornness, the aesthetic recalcitrance of tragedy. Right, the you aesthetic know? recalcitrance, exactly. Recalcitrance is a term that you like, um, that, that is important in this book. Um, the, it, the, the book certainly offers us few consolations and I'm, I'm, I'm often um, 
quick to criticize fantasies about romance and love and narrative resolution, but I always say, well, friendship is the thing that we can like attach our hopes to. Friendship is the goodness in you know, what we could be optimistic about. And you just destroy friendship in the book. Um, fr <laughs> friendship as philia is, is, um, is revealed to be its own kind of death-driven attempt to preserve um, the same. So um, you left me with, with, <laughs> you left well, me you with know, no human. You are, you are, you are con I consider you a, a friend uh -huh. and what you just said about my book shows that you are a real friend. And the fact that you and I don't see each other very much, but actually communicate via text really shows that our friendship really conforms to Derrida's idea of the real friendship. That is to say, it's not an assimilation of the other. It's right. not a reproduction of the other. But other experiences I had in my life of friendship, well, I, I can say that I see an instinct in myself too, to make the friend, you know, a, another form of myself. So actually that move is something that I feel profoundly, you know, that there is in us a desire, you know, to make the philos our own possession. Mm -hmm. um, it becomes cannibalism in your reading of philosophy. Yes, it does. So I, 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 that's where I, you know, use uh, Derrida's metaphors of relationality as a form of eating, eating right. well, Yep. or in this case, a kind of bulimic process. Mm -hmm. You take in the friend and then you spit him out and mm -hmm. then you ingest him again and you spit him out. And so the, the sickness, the disease of, uh, uh, of Philoctetes and the perverse jouissance, you know, produced by that is an expression of what I call bulimic uh, friendship. And even there, there is an emancipator. I mean, I know it's very problematic, but uh, um, I do use uh, some uh, um, scholarly attempts to see bulimic as a form of protest against the symbolic. So Deleuze and Parnay and Elizabeth Gross, but also Susie Orbach and Lucas Crawford. But I do understand that that's problematic and I try to, you know, couch my language in a way that is not too offensive. Right. Um, I want to um, get in two questions that, that came up. We, we only have a few minutes, so maybe you can choose one to answer. Um, first is from Emily Mullen asking if you see Bataille's theory of excess um, and luxury fitting into your conception of the archive. I, I know that Bataille does come up in the book. And the other one is from Karen Feldman, um, and Karen asks, um, uh, says that there are readings of catharsis that focus on the revelation of the connections of events, uh, Ferrari, Petrusevsky, and Hardison. The catharsis focus on the revelation of the connections of events. Do those sorts of readings work with your affect theory approach or your anti-catharsis reading of tragedy? Connection of events, revelation of events. Did well, I hear connect correctly? Uh, the revelation of the connections of events. I guess it's a different um, way of, of understanding what catharsis is doing rather than... Yeah, I think that I would say that the revelation is against a problematic concept for me. Mm. Uh, still, in an ethical perspective, so if you think of uh, the... Uh, um, the chapter on Heracles, where, you know, uh, the catharsis of Heracles is predicated on a revelation. That is to say, Theseus asks Heracles to show his face, to reveal himself. And that raises the question of, I would say, Levinasian ethical infinity, you know, and the transformation of the face into a signifier, into the signifier of the monument that uh, in a sense Theseus produces. So in that respect, you know, I would say that the anti-cathartic move that I trace is anti-revelatory right. because uh, it's uh, about preserving the obscurity of the other, preserving her right to, you know, uh, maintain you know, a kind of unrepresentable and non, not revealable uh, non-identity. Yeah. 
And Karen is adding. Yeah, sure. Adding, it's catharsis is not referring to emotions at all, but as the kind of inexorable unfolding of events. Um, but I think your response already speaks to that um, because there's still a restoration of an order and a logic in, in that connection of events um, uh, uh, or the idea of inexorability that in fact your reading of anti-catharsis refuses. In any case, I'll get in touch with Karen, you know. And exactly, we should save this conversation between the two of you. Yeah, and as for Emily, yes, Bataille comes up, especially the idea of joy, what he calls joy in the face of death, you know, um, which I also read, you know, in an anti-ecstatic mode. I guess that's another element, you know. My reading of catharsis is about, you know, the uh, thwarting, uh, of uh, of ecstasies also, or it's a, a partial ecstasies, for example, in the reading of the Bacchae, where, you know, I talk about the intoxicating power of non-intoxication, and I talk about the kind of uh, um, violence that is also present in uh, becoming part of the Dionysian of the, of, the, of the Dionysian experience. So uh, my position is also anti-Nietzschean in that respect. Mm -hmm. uh, We've arrived at the end of our window. Um, there's so much more to talk about in that each chapter opens up a whole conceptual landscape that would be really fun to delve into. But I encourage everybody to read this, this book. It's really phenomenal. Congratulations, Mario, and thank you. Thank for you, Damon, you're amazing, thank you. It's fun. It's fun to talk face to face. Yes, this was amazing. This was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks, and Thank you to the Townsend Center for giving me this opportunity. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Thanks.